morning. And there's just a picture of quartz, which is the uh, one of the best examples of uh, piezoelectric uh, crystals. Um, we'll discuss a lot of things, including how rocks crack and stuff like that. This one. That's what I pressed. <laughs> okay, in, in my version, uh, this thing isn't moving, but a piezoelectric is when you squeeze it, the voltmeter changes. In the, in the PowerPoint, for reasons I can't figure out, it moves. The other thing is, um, I stopped smoking a long time ago, uh, among my other unhealthy habits. But these piezoelectrics create a spark, and uh, the spark starts a flame, and so this has industrial purposes. And the other one that Yogi had discussed was kids bouncing up and down on sneakers, which will give you flashing lights, uh, which is healthy in the cigarette lighter. Also, if you have a cheap watch, here's an example of a cheap watch. Uh, that's what's inside it, making it go tick-tock, is again the piezoelectric uh, crystal. Here's another piezoelectric giving you a, a cigarette lighter except it's an earthquake. So here you really start crunching the rocks. And this was taken by, um, not a professional, it was taken by a Japanese citizen, and it's well known that the Japanese like carrying around gadgets where they can take pictures uh, when they see anything interesting. And he saw lights that were interesting doing an earthquake, and a lot of people don't believe it. You can forge a photograph but there'd be no point to it, so I believe it. And in fact, Japanese who observe a lot of earthquakes see these lights. Uh, the Chinese also see these lights. I guess they like gadgets these days also. And this is a picture doing an earthquake, but it's not professional. Where you see the light in the sky being given off in an earthquake regime, and if you wait around till night, it's still there. Uh, but again, this was not professional, so people don't believe it. This is the uh, recent tragic earthquake um, in Lakula, and this picture is finally professional. But what I mean by professional is that the European Space Agency took these pictures from a satellite, and if you look in that region during the earthquake tragedy, uh, you see these earthquake lights, which the Japanese and the Chinese have been telling us for years are there, and uh, they were there, and so you get a lot of light from earthquakes. You get a lot of light from earthquakes because crunching light, crunching stones, crunching stones gives you a lot of radiation, very powerful radiation. They're also very light. So crunching stones in an earthquake uh, sounds terrible because you hear the rocks crunching. And when you hear the rocks crunching, they seem to crunch in two kinds of waves, um, S waves and P waves that have nothing to do with what a physicist calls S waves and P waves. S stands for shear and P stands for compression. And the compression wave is faster than the shear wave, which is why when you get a big crunch, and you see the seismic reading, the compressional wave, they call P, comes first, and the shear wave comes second. And this, this is observed everywhere around the Earth. When you finally get enough of this sound and enough of this light coming from the crunching of little cracks, they go into a big crack, and that's what the results of the earthquake looks like. And here at the Polytechnic in Tur Torino, um, they got a little machine that'll cause a mini earthquake. You take granite, which has quartz in it, and you put it in this machine, and you crunch it. And when it crunches, uh, this is what it looks like after the crunch, you have some big cracks, which is a mini earthquake. They find neutrons firing out of it. Now, 
I just really learned about these experiments a month ago, about a month ago. And uh, Yogi and I had visited uh, Torino, and uh, they gave us a demonstration. And they said one thing which really surprised me. They said, you can convert iron into two aluminums plus a couple of fast neutrons. And my answer to them is I thought they were crazy because that's fission. And I don't like the word cold fusion, but if I had to call this something, I would call it cold fission. They were getting fission events by crunching rocks. <coughs> There's, and I had read in the literature that they only had this kind of hospital-like neutron detector, but no, they have three detectors. They have a bubble chamber detector, they have uh, the usual high energy uh, helium-3 detectors, and they're seeing neutrons. Lots of neutrons, uh, lots of chemists are saying, how do you know they're seeing neutrons? Well, everybody else using those equipment that sees neutrons, I mean, that's the way nuclear physicists have been measuring neutrons. I was also told that there's so much iron being converted to aluminum that if you take one of the chips, you can very often see the splotch of aluminum with your eye, just like the cell. And they gave us a demonstration, so I said, if I pick up a chip, am I going to see an aluminum splotch on it? And they said, well, that's a probabilistic question. Why don't you pick one up? So I picked up a chip, and I looked at it. My eyes are, you know, I'm 72 now. My eyes are a little shaky, but I saw it pretty clearly. So you can see it with your eye. The neutrons are plentiful. There is not the slightest doubt that this is what's happening. The only trouble was with Yogi and myself and uh, John Swain, who didn't come to a day or so later, we had no reason for why it was that crunching a rock would induce a fission which required energy. And so we were asked whether we could explain it, and our answer was not the day. It would require more than a day. Uh, maybe it's because there were three of us. Um, I think we got the essence of it in about a week and a half. So um, I, I think we understand it, and it's spectacular in what it applies. This is the group in Torino. Uh, this is another case of crunching rocks. Uh, this is called fracking uh, by people who don't like it. Uh, you dig straight down. You dig straight. This is, by the way, how the United States is going to get over the independent. Shay gas. Shay gas. See, fracking. Right, fracking, yes. Um, and again, there's a matter of crunching rocks. Uh, this is how the U.S plans on getting independent of Saudi Arabian oil. And so what they do is they go down, and you need to measure how deep are you. When do you finally hit the granite, which is piezoelectric? And the way they do that is they, they download down the pipe radiation detectors. And a lot of this stone has been crunched around before, and they each have a different radiation signal. And I believe that's largely due to the difference in the rocks that have been crunched. When they get down to the granite, they see many neutrons and so forth, and they say that's just the way the granite is, but I think that's an oversimplification. When they see the appropriate nuclear radiation, they make a right turn, and then they go like that. And then you pour this rancid water down that pipe, through there, and the rancid water is sitting in that pipe, and you put so much pressure on the rancid water that it goes up into the shell, and it cracks it. That's fracking. <coughs> so you hear the sound, you get the light. I'm sure you get nuclear radiation. Uh, but after you're through cracking it, then you remove the rancid water, and it's a matter of a bunch of lawsuits, what it is you're going to do with that rancid water but you're going to put it in some place where it doesn't affect people, according to the companies. And then you pull out down the same pipe the, uh, the natural gas coming out of the shell, and that is why gas prices have been going down. Okay, so what's involved in piezoelectricity? Mathematically, this is the thermodynamics. Um, a, a shear will produce a polarization, 
and an electric field will produce a stress, and you can create mechanical energy, send it into electrical energy, and because we are theoretical physicists, we describe this as a phonon to photon conversion as a Feynman diagram with the piezoelectric coefficient being at the vertex. If you're an engineer, then you say, if I squeeze the thing, I'll convert it to a voltage. So mechanical power is force times velocity. Electrical power is voltage times current. And the engineering way of describing it is every bit as good as the Feynman diagram way of describing it. It's just that with theoretical training, we have a prejudice on which way we do the calculation. Then this is about tensile strength. This kind of earthquake, these rocks are brittle. So you just go up, and then you hit a point where you hit a, a, a critical strain, and then you fracture the rock. You've seen fractured rocks if you drive, drove past uh, mountains with uh, rocks that have cracks. But these things called micro cracks, yes, I give a reference here if anybody wants it. Uh, this has nothing to do with us, but it's a very good article on understanding micro cracks. Before you get these big cracks, you get these little cracks and they move. When we published it, this is our picture of a little crack taken out of an elasticity book. And this is a picture of what it really looks like with a crack size of about 100 microns. And they move. And if you know Young's modulus, Poisson's ratio, surface tension, you can get the crack size and you can get roughly the stress at which the rock is going to crumble. And um, I show here two articles. One is by Carpentieri and co-workers, um, uh, whose lab we had visited on neutron production within microcracks. Uh, this is by uh, Sevastiava, Swain, and myself on why we think there are neutron production within microcracks. And we would say that it's electroweak interactions uh, gotten by the electric fields. And this is the arithmetic by which we do some numerical estimates. And what's happening is the acoustic waves in the crack are coupled to the microwave waves in the crack, and the energy goes back and forth, and the microwaves accelerate the electrons, and they have a large effect of mass. So we were happy to say this is what's happening, and you get very slow neutrons. Um, Carpentieri informed us that they see some slow neutrons, but they also see fast neutrons at maybe 10 or 20 MeV. So the fast neutrons was outside of the scope of the theory that we had up to that point, because up to that point, we should have gotten long wavelength neutrons, which I think has happened. And but now there was this new process. Oh, this is another this is another little graph taken from a Russian article, uh, pointed out to us by Carpentieri, and uh, in a region of Russia which I can't quite locate. The top graph is what is the energy of each earthquake they've seen over about a 10-year period, and the bottom part is. What are the background neutron counts? And when you have a lot of high energy earthquakes, you have a lot of neutron background neutron counts, and vice versa. So they more or less follow each other, which is another indication that these earthquakes are giving off neutrons. So within about two weeks, because it's only two weeks after that, we had formulated a reason for why that might happen. And that has to do with resonances. On the left-hand side of this picture, you see resonances where electrons and positive charges and atoms and molecules create a plasma frequency. On the right-hand side is if you have a liquid drop model of a nucleus, then when the protons go back and forth opposite the neutrons, you get what's called the giant dipole resonance. Giant dipole resonance physics is not new physics. Uh, it's been studied for years. If I have a damped harmonic oscillator, I can get the total cross-section that a gamma hits a nucleus and gives you an excited nucleus. 
Once it's hit by a gamma of sufficient energy, maybe 15 MeV, then the nucleus goes into an excited state, and then it can fission. Even if it would not naturally fission, it can be caused by gamma rays. Uh, those are the Feynman diagrams for it. We take iron as an example. If you start with iron 56, one of the most stable nuclei around, you can hit it with a photon and excite it, or you can get that photon, then called virtual, from a scattering electron, and then excite it. So we've been calculating these two different processes frantically because we know, or I have a very strong feeling, that this kind of low energy nuclear physics uh, of induced fission is going to very shortly become very important. And so we're racing to make sure we can get out as many results as we can before the hordes come. Okay. Now, this is what the giant dipole resonance looks like. It looks like a resonance. Uh, this is how they do the measurements of that resonant cross-section. You beam dump electrons and you get Bremsstrahlung. You focus the Bremsstrahlung on a crystal and you diffract it. Each diffraction, each diffraction gives you a different energy. And so if I put a bunch of absorbers at different angles to where you bounce the photon off, then I can plot that versus energy. And that's the way you get curves that look like that. And they do look like that. Now, the thing about the Carpentieri events is aside from seeing neutron production, which I was used to, uh, we've been claiming that for five years or so, um, he got some weird ones. He got iron going into two aluminum plus two neutrons, and those two neutrons would be fast, maybe 8 MeV, whereas the neutrons we had been predicting and some people have been observing are more like thermal neutrons. That's, that's a factor of 10 to the 6th in energy down. Also, he is finding iron going to silicon and manganese with four neutrons. And at first, first glance, you say it looks impossible, which is what I told him, and I'm pretty sure Yogi told him, uh, that it's impossible. On the other hand, he's seen it in batteries. He has seen it in crunching rocks. He's seen it in cavitation. So at some point, as a theorist, I have to say I give up. Okay? <laughs> it's happening. I just don't know why. Okay, Excuse me. How big is the Coulomb barrier there? When, when None. You Zero. Zero. How can you say that? Because the electron producing the photon is attracted no, to the problem. nucleus. It's not repelled. No it's not repelled. The electron, all the processes we're using are electrons scattering off nuclei. There's no barrier because they're repelled. By the time the electron excites the thing, there's no barrier because when it fissions, it's going to the lower energy regime. So there are no barriers in this problem. Unlike fusion, where there's a barrier. 